My name is Rich Divizio, and I played Baraka in Mortal Kombat 2. We were trying to come up with characters, you know, and, and we were going to costume stores and, and looking around and uh, found a mask of this uh, monster. Uh, there was this very tight mask that I had to wear. You know, painted it up, you know, kind of made it all, uh, butchered up his face. And I just remember tons and tons of water just coming down my neck. And we took like, uh, you know, fake nails and put them on for his teeth and uh, spray painted them silver. This mask was skin tight. And those made up his teeth. And so people don't realize that, you know, this really scary creature is made up of, you know, a mask and some fake uh, fingernails that were uh, bought in a, a supermarket. That shoot was unbelievable. Baraka hasn't been in many Mortal Kombat games, but he's been a fan favorite for a long time. Baraka wins. Hello, my name is John Parrish. I am Jax! Jax wins. Fatality. Being the big guy, I was using raw strength and mental attitude. Be uh, energetic, to be powerful, to actually portray myself as a hero, as I would look at it. John Parrish was great to work with. He was really one of the um, easiest guys to work with in terms of uh, being able to do all the moves and all of the special attacks. I am the real Jax. We worked with him throughout Mortal Kombat 2 and Mortal Kombat 3, and he did a lot of promotional stuff with us. He was really great. When he first put the makeup on my arms, it took him six hours to do total. Actually, it feels great to be part of the Mortal Kombat legacy. Ugh. I guess not many people know that the, the Tanya character is named after um, my sister, who's named Tanya, and as well as my other sister's name is Sonia. Tanya is the daughter of an Adinian ambassador, but she has sided with the bad guys in previous games. She turned on Liu Kang in, in her ending in Mortal Kombat 4, that she, you know, sided with Shinnok. You know, and she sided with the Deadly Alliance even at one point. Now she's siding with the Dragon King. Not so much because she wanted to, but because she was almost forced into it. She's an enemy of Jade and Katana and Sindel, you know, because she's a traitor. She's a traitor to Adinia, she's a traitor to the realms, and she's, you know, not a good person. Tanya has always had her boomerang projectile move, which is one of the more outrageous uh, projectile moves in the game. And uh, we're giving her that boomerang move in Deception again. And in addition to that, she has a weapon. So she has a bigger arsenal of attacks than she did in the previous games. Finish him.
there were actually two Goro models made, um, and uh, one was used for the actual game and was kind of, it was posed and, you know, changed so much that it kind of fell apart over time. <laughs> And I, actually, I have one of the original Goro models that's stashed away at, at home. Flawless victory. I think Katana was really one of the favorite characters from Mortal Kombat 2. I mean, it was, she was a new character. She had ridiculous combos that people, you know, came up with that I had not even thought of. And so when I saw people doing Katana combos, you know, in the corner, you know there was something special because people were taking the game in a direction that you wouldn't even think of. Well, Katana um, was similar to Melina in that had a limited amount of memory than the Mortal Kombat 2 machine and we wanted to get 12 characters out so Katana and Melina are really kind of the female version of Scorpion and Sub-Zero. Katana ah! uh, wins. Melina was created uh, because we needed to stretch the memory in our game again. We were out of memory, we had a cool female character in Katana, and we wanted to kind of double up on that and give her, you know, special moves and make, make an anti-Katana in a sense. And so that's kind of where Melina came from. And so then, with, the, with Melina, we had also introduced Baraka, so we wanted to make a tie with, with her because Baraka was a really bad character. So underneath the mask, Katana is really beautiful, and underneath Melina's mask is, you know, these really nasty teeth that were originally never on the costume, but we would just kind of draw them in on, on her fatalities. Melina. My name is John Turk, and I am Sub-Zero. You know, the, the freeze move in the first Mortal Kombat really came about because I was always a big fan of kind of setting up the player for a free hit. We walk over to the game and, you know, they're playing Mortal Kombat 3 and, you know, the kid's playing Sub-Zero and I'm standing right behind him and he doesn't even realize that the guy he's playing is right behind him. Let's get something straight. I am not a ninja. I am Lin Kuei. Scorpion was a ninja. My martial arts style defined the character of Sub-Zero based on the way I move, the way I kick, the way I punch, the way I turn, the way I move my leg when I do sweeps.
Shao Kahn was the big bad guy in Mortal Kombat. Feel the power of Shao Kahn. Well, Shao Kahn is kind of like the top of the ladder in terms of big bad guys in the Mortal Kombat series. Prepare to die. He was really the boss's boss in a sense, and he was basically the guy that everybody was ultimately trying to stop in terms of his invasion of Earth in uh, Mortal Kombat 3. And he also had this charge move that would attack you with, and a lot of players didn't realize that all you had to do was duck underneath the charge move and then you got a free uppercut. Once they discovered that, he became a lot more manageable of a character to fight against, but until they discovered that, he seemed almost undefeatable. Shao Kahn was killed in uh, Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, but nobody really ever dies in Mortal Kombat. Jade was the third in a series of characters that was derived from existing images. Jade was a female ninja type character like Melina and Katana were, and she was kind of like an evil version of, uh, of Katana in a sense. Jade is a uh, childhood friend of Katana, which probably makes her thousands of years old, because Katana is thousands of years old. The approach we've taken with Jade in this game, in Mortal Kombat Deception, is that she's more of the stealthy ninja type of character. She's the one that sneaks around and gets information, you know, and carries out covert activities. And uh, I kind of like that about her. She's about getting things done, and she's very loyal. We wanted to give her something that separated her from Katana Molina, so we gave her the staff weapon that was her weapon in Mortal Kombat 3. Not many characters had weapons in Mortal Kombat 3. That was really what we wanted to do to separate her from Katana Molina. <laughs> Cabal first made his appearance in MK3. Uh, he was originally designed as kind of this nomad, you know, sand person kind of character. Again, we really wanted to create a character that seemed to have uh, a handicap of sorts in terms of like he had this breathing apparatus that kept him alive. He still had these incredible powers that none of the other characters had. He had a lot of cool moves. He had this dash, which uh, he would run past a character, spinning him around, and then he could pull off some combos on him. And everybody kind of liked this tornado move where he would run by the opponent and then they would spin like a top and they kind of get a free hit on them. Cabal also had these hook sword weapons that one of the few characters in, in the 2D game that actually had a weapon in the game, so that kind of made him stand out. He was actually one of the characters that was considered almost too powerful in Mortal Kombat 3, and we had to kind of tone him down for Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. For Deception, we finally had the chance to bring Cabal back the way we originally intended him to be. You know, we gave him the long trench coat, gave him a backpack that was part of the original design but back in the old days of digitizing we couldn't really handle that a long coat would have gotten in the way of uh, the characters moves in the 2d games we were really limited to the costumes that we could build because it was digitized graphics and with the 3d games we build the costumes and the computer so we can really do whatever we want cabal's always been one of my favorite characters so i was totally happy to bring him back for a deception give him the classic design that we intended
my first impression of seeing uh, myself in the game. Uh, I was ecstatic, because I knew it was me. I thought it was just awesome. God of Thunder and Lightning, that just kind of became what his thing was. And I think that was really kind of what inspired a lot of his special moves was the fact that he was a god. Uh, in real life, I am a martial arts expert. I've been uh, doing various arts for probably 22 plus years. You know, I'm wearing this hat. <laughs> Got that on. Got that action working. Yeah, the hat is gone. It was it was destroyed with one of the falls that Carlos took, and um, I don't think we've seen it ever since. Do I have the hat? No, I wish I did. That's probably the one thing I wish I had. I feel really thankful to be part of the Mortal Kombat legacy. You know, and it's changed my life. Incredibly. Sonya is a badass. Carrie was easily one of the best people we've worked with in terms of actors playing the characters. Yes, I still have the Sony costume. Every once in a while, I'll bring it out. I'll absolutely see Sonya again in future Mortal Kombat. I would love to play Sonya again. Yeah, Scorpion's always been my favorite character, and he still is to this day. Fight! Playing Scorpion's cool. I mean, you get to be kind of just a little bit crazy, a little bit nuts. You know, it's like, a, you know, you're a ninja. How cool is that? I played him in Sub-Zero Mythologies. I did some motion capture for Scorpion, and I played him during our, some of our live events for Mortal Kombat. I am Scorpion. You killed me in cold blood. As a player, if I get a chance, I'll, I'll always pick Scorpion. His whole play style, it just kind of suits my, my style of, of gameplay. I'm proud to have been part of the Scorpion legacy uh, throughout the years. The spear move has always been one of my favorite moves in uh, all the Mortal Kombat games, and I don't think we've ever been able to top it. Get over here! The former champion of Mortal Kombat and member of the White Lotus Society, Liu Kang was murdered by Shang Tsung. He now exists as a living corpse, fueled by vengeance. Liu Kang was Earthrealm's best hope at preventing Shao Kahn from taking over. 
After defending Earthrealm for many years against the forces of evil, Liu Kang was eventually killed by the Deadly Alliance, which was Quan Chi and Shang Tsung. Liu Kang has always been the ultimate hero in Mortal Kombat. He's been kind of like the, the common man character throughout the whole series. We don't give him the crazy violent moves. He's a Shaolin monk. You know, we really wanted to make him the character that was the hero of the game. So we did that for a number of titles and finally we really wanted to kind of change things up. At this point, uh, Liu Kang exists in two forms. He's an undead corpse and he's also his spirit self. Yeah! <laughs> You know, Liu Kang was designed to be the most accessible Mortal Kombat character. You know, his moves are the simplest to perform. Tor towards, high punch, tor towards, high kick. So he had these really cool flying kicks and fireballs, and anybody can perform them because the combination was so easy to do. And so our idea with Liu Kang was always to make that the most accessible character that, you know, you can basically show your mom how to play Mortal Kombat using Liu Kang. Him. Okay, Fatality. For Deception, our goal was to really say, let's bring back the nostalgic characters. And obviously Sindel, Nightwolf, Baraka, Melina, all of those are in that category. And so we had to bring them back. Fight! The wig that we had in Mortal Kombat 3 for Sindel didn't have that much hair. We did a lot of after after effects touch-ups. She had this ability to scream at super loud volumes and that, that was kinda that would stun the opponent and give you kind of a free hit. Sindel wins. A denizen of Chaos Realm, Havoc despises order and sees it as a threat to everything in which he believes. His mission is to create mayhem and further unravel the fabric of life. He will also destroy anyone who seeks to control others. Havoc is the Cleric of Chaos. Havoc's philosophy is that chaos is good, order is bad, rules are bad. His arch nemesis is Hotaru, who is all about order and control. The interesting thing about Havoc's personality is that he doesn't form alliances with anyone unless it somehow will bring disorder to the universe. So he's not good or bad. Havoc is about promoting his own agenda, which is chaos. Originally Havoc was designed to be noob, but the design was a little too far-fetched from his original, you know, all-black costume. So Havoc is developed with his own character. We wanted to have a character that kind of looked like he was decaying. When we thought of special moves for him, we thought, okay, let's do stuff that looks really disturbing. So we had him, you know, breaking his own bones. And when he would choose projectiles, his knees would bend the wrong way. His uh, Harakiri move, where basically he would just tear his own head off show it to the camera and then fall over dead. So we really wanted his moves to be something that were disturbing and would make the audience kind of wince and like, ah, oh, you know, every time he's doing these moves.
Chou Jiao, or penetrating foot, is one of the oldest recorded styles of Kung Fu. The art is 30% fist and 70% kicking. Hands are used to protect, but it is the feet that always attack. Most of the northern Chinese arts have adopted Chou Jiao into their style. Moloch is a creature known more for his strength than his intellect. Astoundingly powerful and remarkably cruel, this hulking brute takes pure delight in the pain and suffering of others, especially if he has caused that pain. Like Dramin, Moloch is an Oni from the Nether Realm. He and Dramin have escaped the Nether Realm, and now they're running amok. Initially, Moloch and Dramin had a deal with Quan Chi that he would help them escape the Nether Realm if they were to protect him from Scorpion. But he escaped the Nether Realm and left them there, and they're really pissed. So now that Moloch and Dramin have escaped the Nether Realm, they have a vendetta against Quan Chi. Moloch is one of the Onis that made an appearance in Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. He's just a big gorilla kind of character, which makes him stand out from all the other Mortal Kombat characters. He has a big ball and chain as his weapon. He's more of a brute, I think more so than any other character in Mortal Kombat. Moloch was the big boss guy in Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, and he was one of the odder boss characters because he had this big ball that was kind of fused to his hand. So we knew that we were going to be creating moves that were involved, this big bowling ball that was basically fused to his hand, you know, slamming it on the ground, causing quakes, smashing it into his opponents. He had such a hunchback that you didn't realize how big of a character it was. Most of Moloch's moves involved this big bowling ball that was kind of fused to his hand attacking opponents with him. We put a huge amount of damage on him. He didn't have an elaborate way of moves that he could perform, but the ones that he did that involved this ball were very damaging, you know, almost half the opponent's energy. Mui Fa is one of the ten core handsets of Northern Shaolin Temple. Plum Flower utilizes all four directions for attacking and defending, as well as hidden chin'a techniques. Round one. 
fight. Ashra has always, for some reason, been associated as looking. People think she's a female Raiden, which was, was never the intention. But I think it's because she had the whole white garment on and, and a hat. Everybody associated her with female Raiden, which uh, was wrong. She's probably one of the uh, the stronger characters in the game because she has a very large number of special moves. You know, she has probably one of the higher count of special moves than any other characters in Deception. The idea behind Ashra, her storyline, is that she is a demon who has found this sword that as she kills other demons she becomes more and more holy. And she's figured out that if she keeps doing this eventually she'll be expelled from the nether realm and that's what she really wants. No one really wants to stay in the nether realm. But she has a real sense of, a, of purity where you know she, she's drawing herself up out of, out of the murk. It is something that, uh, a, a theme that Mortal Kombat hasn't really hit much on before. As she kills demons in the nether realm she's purifying herself. We like to think of her as an ascending demon as, as opposed to a fallen angel. Ashra is basically a, a bad character that's becoming good, that's trying to redeem herself. As she kills demons, she becomes better. What I really enjoy is her, her magical abilities. When, when I'm playing with the Ashra character, she has the vertical spin. She has the horizontal spin where she comes directly at you. She can throw projectiles up in the air, which will come down on your head, as well as a close attack on you. So she has these varied special abilities that are magical, kind of in nature, which really makes her fun to play. Of all the new characters in uh, Mortal Kombat Deception, I suspect that Ashra will probably have the biggest impact. Her looks and her moves, I think she'll have the biggest impact in uh, Deception. Smoke originally came from our memory limitations that we've had in doing arcade games. And just as Scorpion and Sub-Zero were using the uh, same images and getting more mileage out of them by changing the color, when we were out of memory for Mortal Kombat 2, I always liked putting in secret characters in the game at the last minute that nobody knows about. That was kind of like the origin of Smoke and Jade. They were, you know, just kind of like the alternate colored versions of Sub-Zero and Melina and Katana. He had a lot of cool moves as a robot. He had this uh, grappling hook that would come out of his chest and um, just had a lot of cool moves, which made him a player favorite. We brought Smoke back for Deception just because people have been asking about him for a while now. It was funny because a lot of fans like the ninja version, a lot of fans like the robot version, so we thought it would be a good idea to bring back both. Every one of our characters in Deception has kind of two costumes, and so for, for Smoke we decided we're going to have him be a normal ninja like people had seen him before in Mortal Kombat 2, and then also his Mortal Kombat 3 persona, which is kind of like the cybernetic ninja. Players can pick which one they want to play as. Uh, Darius was the last character that we um, we came up with for Deception. He plays a little on the chaos side with this new chaos order element that we have going in Mortal Kombat Deception. He is from Hotaru's realm of order, but he's the leader of the resistance movement. Finish him. We were trying to find two different 
looks for him. His primary look was more like a uniform that would be one of the underground organizations in another realm or outworld. But we wanted to go a different route with his alternate and kind of pay tribute to a lot of the films that influenced the series. And there are certain stars that we look to as inspiration, and if not only in the feel of the game, but also in the look. I think he's probably one of the characters in the game that everybody associates with certain Hong Kong martial arts movies. A lot of people kind of gravitate to him for some reason. He just has like an appeal that um, it's hard to explain. I'd like to see Darius in some future Mortal Kombat games. I think he's a cool looking character. I like his look. You know, I hope he comes back and I hope we can do something with him in the future. He is also another unique character where uh, the more you play, the more and more you like the character, especially when you start beating the people with his built-in weapons and his weapon stance. He's kind of more of like an Americanized, less Japanese fighting character. And then he's got these kind of gauntlets on him, which, you know, I don't think any characters really had anything like that. Just lean and mean, aggressive style. <laughs> Fatality. It was not by chance that this struggle came to be. The blame falls squarely upon my shoulders for giving evil the chance it needed, and therefore fulfilling an ancient prophecy. Raiden's Earthrealm champions had failed to stop the Deadly Alliance from fully resurrecting the mummified army of the Dragon King. In the end, only Raiden himself stood between the Earthrealm and total destruction. Defying the Elder God's wishes, he alone challenged Quan Chi and Shang Tsung in mortal combat, Earthrealm's last hope for freedom. <laughs> Raiden fought well against the two sorcerers, and it seemed as though victory was at hand. But the combined might of Quan Chi and Shang Tsung proved to be overwhelming, even for a Thunder God. The Deadly Alliance had won. The sorcerer's victory was short-lived, however. Once they realized that an alliance was no longer necessary, suspicion and lust for power overcame them. The former allies then turned their aggression on each other. <laughs> Quan Chi defeated Shang Tsung and reveled in his conquest. But it is said that there is only one true ruler of Outworld. And that ruler had finally returned. Onaga, former Emperor of Outworld. The Dragon King. No! It cannot be! The prophecy had been fulfilled. The Dragon King had indeed returned to Outworld to reclaim his army and impose his dominance. Death awaited all who stood in his way.
And so it was that a new alliance was formed out of desperation. Mortal enemies joined forces to combat a greater threat. Raiden began to realize that even their combined might was not enough to defeat the Dragon King. What are you doing? You don't want to know. There was only one chance left. Raiden's sacrifice was in vain. For the blast had little effect on the Dragon King. Now Onaga has what he needs to shape the realms as he sees fit. I was the fool who brought him this power. Only I can destroy this threat, born of deception. Monkey Fist, a martial art which movements are based on that of a monkey. The art was created by a famous Chinese martial artist who had been locked in prison and developed a style based on the movements of the monkeys he observed outside of his prison cell window. Now, you will use this map on your next mission. Guan Chi has once again retained your services. This map you saw, it shows the way to a temple which predates man's recorded history on Earth. For thousands of years, the Temple of Elements has been hidden in what is now known as the Himalayan Mountains of Nepal. This map is the only evidence of its existence. Fine. I get to the temple, and then what? Cha Chuan is a northern style of Kung Fu. It is a branch of Jiao Min or Muslim style Kung Fu, and considered one of the five long fist styles utilizing both hand and foot at the same time to execute its graceful and rhythmic movements. This is one of China's most famous long fist styles. Hua Chuan is one of the five long fist styles and can be viewed as a close range martial art. Flower Fist has many wrestling and ground tactics, as well as hand and foot strikes, making it a well-rounded northern Chinese style. Taru's mission is to keep order at any and all costs. Hotaro is an interesting character. He kind of has this whole loyalty and order persona, and he has kind of a big presence. When designing Hotaro's costume, at first I took his name into account, because his name means firefly in Japanese. So went off in like this bug-like direction, but ended up with more of like a hard shell armor that was less bug-like and more warrior-like. So with Hotaru and Havoc, we wanted to try, what about chaos and order? Hotaru is basically on the order side. Havoc is on the chaos side. For instance, Hotaru actually sides with the Dragon King for the sole reason that he will bring order to the universe. You know, he doesn't care how he brings order to the universe, but he will bring order to the universe. One of his attacks that I like to use a lot, which is his projectile that shoots at the ground and kind of explodes out. I think it's visually one of the most exciting moves to see, but also it has a dramatic strategic value when you're playing. It's, it's, uh, it's cool because like, you, you can shoot the projectile and it enables you to go ahead and do a, a second move if you're quick enough. You know? So it's cool you get a chance to maybe do a combo. Hutaru uh, came out pretty interesting that um, he has uh, a lot of cool effects and I would say some signature moves that'll make him pretty popular. Hutaru is definitely one of the more striking characters in the game as far as all the new characters. Hutaru will uphold the letter of the law regardless of, of the consequences or, or the means to get there. <laughs> Hotaru wins. Fatality.
Fighting for the freedom of her enslaved people, Li Mei was trained by Xu Jinko in the art of combat. Now she is a formidable warrior who battles for her people and for persecuted souls everywhere. Li Mei is originally from Outworld. Her village was enslaved by Quan Chi and Shang Tsung. She vowed to defeat the Deadly Alliance in order to free her people. Mortal fatality. Because she had this kind of skimpy outfit, we gave her a lot more acrobatic and you know, provocative moves in the game. So she has these crazy flip kicks where her legs are doing things that are just physically impossible. So she's kind of like the sexy bombshell character from Deadly Alliance. Probably one of my favorite moves from Li Mei is her backflip kick. She rotates around in an impossible way, pops the opponent up for a juggle, so it's a sexy and useful move. Li Mei wins. Fatality. After his family was murdered, Dairu's hunger for revenge allowed him to be tricked into killing an innocent man. Now the former Satan guardsman works alone as a mercenary. He takes assignments where he can find them, whether they are noble or not. Dairu was a part of the same uh, military force as Hotaru in the Realm of Order. Dairu was accused of a crime and was about to be sentenced. Eventually Dairu breaks free and becomes a rogue. Dairu was a character that was introduced in Deception, but we actually had begun working on him during Deadly Alliance, and he didn't make the cut. I always thought he was a cool-looking character, and um, he has one of the most powerful moves in Deception with his back slam move that pops the opponent up for uh, certain juggles. That back slam move is easily my favorite of all of Dyra's moves. Mian Chuan, or Continuous Palm, is a martial art popular in Hebei province of China. The main philosophy is to be defensive, then offensive. Softness turns to hardness, thus giving the practitioner the upper hand in combat. This style was first presented to the general population during the 1936 Olympic Wushu demonstration. You are reality's only hope. I'll do it, Thunder God. Maybe because I don't... <laughs> you don't understand. I can't leave without the... Oh, I'm like, okay, okay. Don't make me laugh. <laughs> you see, Sub-Zero. You can trust the Zora Zora sometimes. Hold on, you guys got me now.
Ah! A mortal with the ability to freeze. I forgot my line. You suck. A mortal. I mean, a keeper. <laughs> Sir, a mortal has escaped from the... Sir, a mortal has escaped from the prison of souls. He is headed towards the gates of immortality. It's okay. One more. Sir. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, she doesn't say. We have toyed with the ninja long <laughs> mortal. Do not question. Ah, oh, forget it. We have toyed with the ninja long enough. <laughs> Do not fail. We, you and I. <laughs> <laughs> we, you, me, everybody in this Oh, No cap. This unfortunate bystander finds himself embroiled in an otherworldly struggle simply by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. A motion capture artist, Mocap now fights for his life. Fantasy and reality have become one and the same. Mocap has a little bit of a storyline. Um, you know, he does motion capture for movies and video games. And, um, but it's not a deep story. I have no idea how I got here. One moment I was in a motion capture studio in Chicago, the next moment I was here. It was an, 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 a late addition to the Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance lineup. Hey! It's acting! It's the life, man. Mocap is based on Carlos Bessina. He's our motion capture expert on the game and a uh, very talented performer. He's been in every Mortal Kombat game. He started out as Raiden. <laughs> Got that on. Got that action working. At some point, we were coming up with hidden characters, Blaze being one of them from Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance, and mocap was something we could easily put together. And we decided that let's make him look like Carlos, put Carlos in the game, and um, that's the main motivation behind the mocap character. Carlos is the life of this game. Ed and Steve together uh, came up with the idea of, hey, let's put in this funny, you know, Carlos mocap character, uh, which, you know, I thought was pretty flattering. But, you know, it's also kind of weird seeing, you know, a fatality performed on your head. So, so it's kind of disturbing a little bit. Grandmaster, in failing my mission, I have dishonored the Lin Kuei. An unfortunate event. Your incompetence will cost our clan dearly. Now you will pay with your life!
centuries ago, before the rule of Shao Kahn, Outworld was controlled by Onaga, the Dragon King. Recently, Onaga has found his way back to Outworld and is attempting to reclaim his former empire by any means. Onaga, also known as the Dragon King, was the original ruler of Outworld, who was overthrown by Shao Kahn sometime in the distant past. The Dragon King came back to life by possessing Reptile's body. You see a hint of that in Sindel's Mortal Kombat Deception ending, where in the background you can see Reptile laying there on the ground after she has killed the Dragon King. In Mortal Kombat Deception, Onaga's main goal was to become the ultimate ruler of Outworld again. In Armageddon, he finds that he has to make some alliances to achieve that goal. Onaga the Dragon King is the big boss in Mortal Kombat Deception. The whole story is kind of wrapped around him. The Dragon King is kind of like a, a character that had been evolving through a number of Mortal Kombat games. You know, we had kind of hinted in a number of our endings that Reptile was becoming this character that was evolving over time into a bigger character. And Deadly Alliance started making reference to this Dragon King character and associating it with Reptile. He was really kind of like one of these characters that was like hinted and then finally revealed in Deception as the big boss character in the game. He's a huge character, massive wings, very ominous looking character. Easily my favorite Onaga move is his throw, where he basically just grabs the opponent, flies up in the air, and then throws him down on the ground. It's probably the most cinematic throw move that we've had in a Mortal Kombat game. A leader of the Red Dragon Clan, Mavado has undertaken a ruthless campaign of extermination against his rivals, the Black Dragon. Scouring the realms for his sworn enemies, Mavado vows that he will not rest until every last trace of the Black Dragon has been erased. Mavado is from Earthrealm. He's a high-ranking member of the Red Dragon Clan. His main objective has been to eradicate any members of the Black Dragon Clan. <laughs> Mavado originally started out as more of a matador kind of character, which didn't fit into the Mortal Kombat look at all. Mavado was another character who started out looking completely different than he ended up looking in the final version of Deadly Alliance. At one point, we just weren't happy with the direction that we're going, so we decided to go a lot more towards a, a darker, black trench coat type of look. My favorite move from Movado is probably his throw move, more like the opposite of Scorpion's spear, where he had these ropes that he could stick to the ground, propel himself forward and back, put his two ropes into the ground, and use the, the rubber band action from that to, to kick the opponent away. That was one of the cool moves in the game. Dogs lick me. Because I wear clean underwear, and when I don't, it's usually quite brutal. and uh, figured that word kind of broke itself up nicely into three Asian sounding kind of syllables. So bo rai cho equals boracho, and hopefully some of you guys got that. I think 
He's one of my favorite characters. I know a lot of people think he's kind of silly with his drunken moves, but he's actually one of the most powerful characters in the game. He's actually one of uh, our comic relief characters, you know, Johnny Cage and Bo Raicho's kind of the next one there. Just the idea of this guy who just looks out of control, like he's just trashed, but he's a great fighter and he incorporates that into his fighting. Very um, deceiving as far as his opponents go. Bo Raicho is the mentor of Shujinku, and so yeah, he has a very prominent role in uh, Deception. He was originally introduced in Deadly Alliance, and he was a fun character because he, he had this sort of jolly demeanor. He likes to drink, he likes, he, li he likes to do his martial arts, and he likes to teach. He's a very likable character to me, and I kind of like the idea that, you know, Mortal Kombat now has a teacher. You know, most martial arts movies, there's always that, you know, old guy that the young guy learns from, and Bo Cho kind of fills that role for uh, Mortal Kombat. <laughs> Ed had wanted to um, have a character that is uh, basically this slob. Like he pukes, he farts, he just you know has no sense of self-control. And the sound that uh, Dan Forden came up with was so funny that <laughs> we just had to get it into the game. Yeah, you know that's one of the things that we put in the game that you know we thought that the the, the humor would wear out, but. Apparently every time somebody on the team listens to it or hears that, that sound, um, it manages to get a giggle out of them. And... Oh, that's a stinky one. <laughs> Place. It feels dark. As dark as every part that it has. Shujinko is kind of our next generation Liu Kang. Through the conquest mode, you uh, learn about Shujinko's past. He lives in the MK universe meets up with all the characters and eventually trains to become a warrior. It's kind of fun walking around, you know, and, and you know, you meet with Sub-Zero or an ancestor of Sub-Zero. I am Princess Kitana. If you are the champion of the Elder Gods, perhaps you can aid us in our struggle. When you finish it, you see him at age, you know, 60 or something like that, and that's when he is basically unlocked in the arcade game. <laughs> Shujinko wins! Everything from, you know, 20-year-old Shujinko up to old man Shujinko um, is voiced by Max Crawford. Younger Shujinko is just a little variation of, of my actual voice. Good to see you again, Damashi. It was fun doing the old man. <laughs> oh, Master Boraijo, crack the dojo window. A student of Lin Kuei Grandmaster Sub-Zero, Frost is a formidable young warrior. Her powers of cryomancy are extremely advanced for one so young. Headstrong and driven, her abilities are eclipsed only by her overconfidence. Frost is very similar to Sub-Zero in that she has freezing powers. Her initial storyline is that she was trying to join the Lin Kuei, which was just reforming under the leadership of Sub-Zero. So she joins the clan, and Sub-Zero is so impressed with her fighting abilities and a little curious about the fact that she has powers over cold. He sort of takes her under his wing, takes her with to Outworld to fight the Deadly Alliance. Frost is kind of the female Sub-Zero, if you want to 
think of it. We, ever since we had the first Sub-Zero, we had always talked about having a female version of Sub-Zero. And uh, for some reason, we didn't do it in Mortal Kombat 2, 3, and 4. And for Deadly Alliance, we knew that we wanted to have a female freezing kind of character like Sub-Zero is, but give her her own story. Frost was one of the first characters we actually designed for Deadly Alliance. Eventually became one of the player's favorites. I remember when the public initially got wind of uh, Frost being a female Sub-Zero, the backlash that we got for that. There were fans that were very upset that we were doing a female Sub-Zero. And I remember one letter we got where some fans said, Mortal Kombat will be destroyed if you do this. In fact, I think Frost is one of the best characters we have. I like her a lot. I think she's pretty cool. The design of the Frost costume was done by Herman Sanchez, and he came up with this really great kind of frozen spiked hair for her with, you know, mist coming out of it, and that really became one of her more kind of signature visual traits that she's had in the game. And I've always thought that that was one of the more innovative design features we had in Deadly Alliance. Uh, my favorite Frost fighting move is her ground freezing projectile, where she basically shoots a beam of, of ice at her opponent along the ground, because we've never had one that was tracking the player along the floor. She has another slide move as well, but I think the, the ground freeze is easily my favorite move. Ah! Ah! Salat Pensak or Pensak Salat is an Indonesian Malaysian martial art which dates from about the 4th century. The term Pensak Salat was first used in 1948 with the unification of many schools under one association. A close in fighting art with many hand, foot, and elbow strikes. I believe Kenshi's name in Japanese means sword saint. His storyline from his past is that he used to travel Japan and challenge experienced swordsmen and warriors just to defeat them so he could become the best in Japan. Eventually he lets his ego get the best of him and so Shang Tsung gets him to open up this tomb of Kenshi's ancestors which blinds Kenshi. Shang Tsung then absorbs these warrior souls and becomes stronger and he leaves Kenshi for dead. Kenshi then realizes what has just happened and now he's got a vendetta against Shang Tsung. His sword that he finds there in the tomb is actually his ancestor's sword. Fight! You would assume he's disabled because he doesn't have certain abilities, but then we compensated it by giving him other abilities, and that kind of makes him that much more interesting of a character. So he's one of the strongest characters in Deadly Alliance, and you wouldn't think so having a character being blind. <laughs> Kenshi basically has the ability to propel his opponents in various directions. Lift them up over his head and slam them on the ground, propel them behind him, push them forward. So it's really like he's a, a very powerful distance player where you, um, you, know, you have the ability to attack your opponent even when you're at great distances.
Goju Ryu is one of the primary styles of Okinawa Karate. It was created by a famous Japanese martial artist who was influenced by his early sensei, a Nahate master, and a student of Shorinji and Chinese martial arts. He combined these styles into what is now called Goju Ryu Karate. Kira is a, a Black Dragon member. She's kind of with uh, with Kano and everything. And it would, one of the cool things about Kira was that because she's kind of with Kano and she's against Sonya, well, the one thing that I wanted to do was I wanted to give her a combination of all of Kano's moves and Sonya's moves from Deadly Alliance. So she's kind of like the morph of Kano and Sonya. So she's a bad person, but she has all of Sonya's moves. She also has Kano's fighting style and uh, all of their super moves combined together we gave Kira. Kira it has joined uh, the new, newly reformed Black Dragon under the leadership of Cabal. She's kind of tough. Uh, she's definitely, a, I, I would say, a bad guy. But she's more disciplined than some of the other Black Dragons have been, like Kano. And she prides herself on her more disciplined take on evil. So Cabal sees in her a new spark that can really benefit the new Black Dragon. The moves that uh, Kira was given really makes her powerful, especially with her double-handed weapons. She moves very, very fast, but it can be powerful when used in chains and combinations. She takes a little bit getting used to, but if you can master her, she can hold her own. Uh, her attacks are very violent, and her weapons are very violent. She's kind of like the fatal attraction character. <laughs> Faltudo is Portuguese for anything goes and is used to describe the no-holds-barred fighting competitions in Brazil and other South American countries. Hand strikes, kicks, throws and grappling are all part of this style of fighting.
win the Mortal Kombat tournament and free Earthrealm from your tyranny. Is that so? Then it seems I will need a stronger opponent to defeat the great Kung Lao. Goro, fight! <laughs> character that I played in Mortal Kombat was definitely Quan Chi. We do not fail! We have toyed with the ninja long enough. Quan Chi was a really interesting character because he was created for a game called Mortal Kombat Mythologies. You are responsible for this sorcerer! Which was a, an adventure game that was being uh, produced at the same time as we were doing Mortal Kombat 4. And so we thought it would be interesting to have him make an appearance in Mortal Kombat 4 as well as Mythologies, even though those two games happen in completely different parts of the Mortal Kombat timeline. Quan Chi is one of the most mystifying characters to me. We really don't know what his origins are other than he's from the Nether Realm and he's part of the Brotherhood of Shadow. Who knows how old he is? You know, he could be as old as the nether realm itself. But he is definitely evil. He is definitely an evil guy. I think of him as the greatest sorcerer in the Mortal Kombat universe. I think of him as being even more powerful than Shang Tsung. Rich Divizio was hilarious as Quan Chi. <laughs> uh, he really played the part well. To me, he is Kano, and he is also Quan Chi. He's, he's both of those characters. You can't look at Quan Chi and not think Rich. And now, on to Hollywood. The makeup was unbelievable, and I was actually able to act a little bit in full motion videos, which was very exciting for me. I remember that the impetus behind the cabinet design on MK4 was the reintroduction of the series back then. They wanted it to stand out in the midst of the arcades. As such, they wanted to push the sides as something that you could not miss. So he did some shots in the studio, had Rich come in, put fire behind him, big old Quan Chi face, no one can miss it. And that's what ended up happening. The first time I saw myself on the side of the Mortal Kombat 4 arcade stand-up, I was just blown away. That chapter in Mortal Kombat 4 was the Quan Chi show in a sense. Do not fail. Choi Le Foot is a martial arts created by a famous Chinese man who named the art after the three masters who instructed him. A southern Chinese style composed of three different systems as well as Lohan Qigong. 